Um, but actually, it's a very special opportunity that we have now to continue our conversation with Dr. Supchai. So the, what I would suggest that we do for the panel discussion, which is now only two, unfortunately, Mr. Perula actually had to leave. One thing I didn't mention, by the way, about uh, Ambassador Perula when he was speaking, uh, he has a very special place in my heart uh, because the first conference that ICD ever did was actually at his embassy, uh, at the Hungarian embassy here in Germany. Uh, so in that sense, he really got to know ICD at the very beginning. Uh, so it was personally great also to have a chance to see uh, Mr. Perula again. Uh, unfortunately, he just had to head to the parliament, though, so he won't join us for the panel. Uh, however, uh, the good news that I see in that is that will give us more of a chance to interact with Dr. Supchai. Uh, so I really what I want to do, I have a few questions here that I maybe will, we can begin with one of them uh, to kind of get the conversation going. Uh, and then I'd be very happy uh, to take your questions uh, and your comments and really to keep this as, as interactive as we can. Uh, so see this as your panel discussion as opposed to mine, and I will share the, uh, the burden of moderation, so to speak, with all of you. Uh, but I think it's really a special chance that we have to, to have such an interaction. So the topic for the panel discussion, uh, the importance of nation branding in contemporary international economics. Nation branding, as I mentioned earlier, is a field I have sort of mixed feelings about. Uh, on the one hand, the skeptic in me says, uh, you know, what is this? Basically, countries trying to come up with these brands as if they're corporations. Uh, I think back to the day when it was George W. Bush who hired actually a number of women from the advertising field to assist him with public diplomacy. Uh, some of you may have heard of Charlotte Bears. Uh, Charlotte Bears was actually very famous for her work doing the Uncle Ben's uh, ad, ad, ad campaign for Uncle Ben's rice. Uh, and again, for me, that seemed like a disconnect. You can't really take advertising strategies and apply them to countries. Uh, and basically, that was you know, more or less George W. Bush's plan. Let's sell America as if it's a product. Uh, and clearly, one can't directly translate those, those strategies to actually uh, the field of diplomacy. On the other hand, uh, nation branding has had a proven impact on many countries. Uh, so it's a field where, as I said, I have mixed feelings. Uh, so I sort of have an initial skepticism to it, in the sense, this idea of branding as if it's a com company. Uh, on the other hand, there are proven results. Now, I mentioned Croatia before. Uh, Turkey is also another very successful example. It's been amazing to see what they've done. Uh, you could even take cities, for example, Dubai. Uh, now is in less of a good economic situation, but for a while, they were everywhere in terms of advertising, and I think it really did succeed at attracting much investment and much attraction to the city of Dubai. So I can find sort of examples on either way. Uh, I mentioned earlier today Nigeria uh, is looked upon as a, as a failure, uh, where they spend lots and lots of money. Uh, but there again, that brand didn't represent the reality. So I was thinking to begin this conversation. Uh, Dr. Supra, you are someone who has traveled in probably every country of the world, if not almost. Uh, you've seen this firsthand, I think, from the point of view of an outsider as well as from the point of view of an insider. You might even refer to the case of Thailand. Uh, what are your own perspectives, first of all, let's say in a general way, uh, in terms of nation branding? Uh, have you seen success stories? Do you see limitations? Uh, do you have advice? Are there certain considerations we should take into account uh, when we look at the field of nation branding? Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. And why don't we, I'll turn, I'll turn it on for you, hold on. Okay, okay please. Okay. I'm not very uh, accustomed to the, uh, uh, the term uh, nation branding very much, and this is probably to be discussed with somebody like Philip Kotler. I, I would have, if I would have known this, I, I, I could have raised with him. Uh, I am used to the, uh, the UN official <coughs> classification Classification may be also uh, uh, equated with uh, branding. Uh, for UN, uh, classification of countries like developing countries, uh, least uh, developed countries, landlocked countries, small island developing, uh, de developing states, the SIDs, the LLDCs, the LDCs, uh, the DCs, these are all uh, uh, official UN classification or branding. So again, according to the UN uh, uh, terminology, there are different countries according to their economic uh, development and, uh, and, and vulnerabilities and human resource development, uh, they're classified in different groups. Uh, some countries uh, uh, make use of this uh, classification uh, uh, to, to their benefits. Of course, uh, the LDC is very clear. Uh, when I work on, on LDC issues, if I go and ask, let's say, European Union for some financial support, they would give it readily. So for all the, for, for the LDCs, are 50 of them now, 49, 50, the, the newest one will be South Sudan. Uh, it's very generous uh, uh, philanthropic uh, assistant uh, for the LDCs. Now for those that are just a little bit above the LDCs, the so-called middle income country, 
there are two types of middle-income countries. Uh, the emerging countries, you see, the middle-income countries that are emerging countries, these are the likes of the BRICS, the likes of the ASEAN, who are really on the, on the top half of the middle-income countries. There are, there are low-income, mid, uh, low middle-income country, the, uh, the, the lower half. And some of these are some of the island states, uh, some of the island states. They would have income per capita beyond 1,500 uh, per head. Uh, but because the size is small, if you look at some of the Caribbean countries, they, they consider to be richer because they have very high income per capita. And yet in terms of amenities, in terms of human resource development, in terms of vulnerabilities, they're just like the LDCs. So uh, if I come from the UN side and I look at this, I would say, look, I mean, some of the, our branding, our classification are useful. But we have to be flexible. I have to, I have to share the budget uh, between the LDCs that I need to help, the 50 countries. But I have 100 more in the so-called group of 77, G77 and China. This is a group of the open countries. There are about 100 and, I don't know, 50, 30, 50 countries. So there are 100 more countries that are in need of help, and uh, they're not being helped. And, and now a new, a new branding of country is emerging, the so-called emerging country group. Now, emerging countries is never an official term. And many countries like India, China, Brazil, they, I, I would say they hate the term. They don't like the term. So when I go to these countries, I don't go around and, and just say you are emerging, emerging, that and that. They don't, they don't accept it. Korea of all country also. Korea, I met several presidents and they keep saying, look, I mean, you guys in, in, in New York, in Geneva, you talk, you talk of Korea as a member of OECD, yes, as a, as a developed country. Don't believe it. That we are still developing country. Korea is still developing countries, according to the leaders of Korea. So in, in official terms, in, in the branding of the countries, I think you need to be flexible. It's, it's, uh, emerging countries syndrome is now being practiced in the World Trade Organization. Because some of the advanced countries are saying, look, the Doha round negotiations are not going to move anywhere unless the so-called emerging countries have to pay up more, meaning to contribute more towards market access uh, opening. Uh, and, and, and the likes of the Indian, the, 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 the Brazilian, the Chinese, the, they don't want to do this. They said, look, that we are emerging. We don't even say ourselves we are emerging. We're just still very poor. So a lot of poor people in Brazil, for example, unemployment is rife in, in, in Brazil. In China, you have inequalities we talked about. In India, still very, very poor. You can't, you can't actually put more burden on, on these countries. So I, I would say that, uh, I know this is not your kind of branding, but this is one type of branding. Uh, uh, we call it classification, which can be used and can be misused. Uh, you have to be very careful. Now, uh, I look at the new the marketing branding type the marketing branding type, and uh, many countries are practices, as I, yeah, you said, Mark, uh, people, countries are employing uh, a lot of publicity uh, companies who, to help brand and find niche for their countries. Th there are some very successful cases, I would say. I mean, uh, some of our friends in, uh, in, in Asia and Malaysia, Malaysia used the branding of truly Asia, of truly Asia, Malaysia, truly Asia, you must have heard of this, Malaysia, truly Asia. You go to Malaysia, you see the whole Asia, it's, it's, even me as a Thai, when I go to Malaysia, I feel, I mean, really Asia, because you know, everything is in Malaysia, the, the scenery, the custom, and everything. And Malaysia has been very, very efficient in adopting all kinds of dances from the neighboring countries and, and amalgamated with their own dancing. It makes Malaysia truly Asia, very successful. And, and uh, small country, but they have huge number of tourists going to Malaysia compared to neighboring countries. Uh, I look at India. India does incredible India. You see, when you have India, on the, your, your, your screen, uh, television screen, incredible India, wonderful marketing of India, and it's really incredible India, and I thought I like it very much. I, I like India a lot, and I like the incredible, what is it, blend of Indian uh, languages and, and culture. It's, it's not a country with one language, it's 100 languages in India. So in India, every time I go, it's just really intriguing. So incredible India is really incredible. And I can go on like this because you can see from the, uh, the uh, advertisement spots uh, on television that this is really successful. And I think uh, it's not that bad. Because when I look at the, uh, at the, at the LDCs, the least the of countries, the ones that are graduating are the ones that have done the best in terms of tourism promotion. You'll be surprised. 
And this is like the Maldives. I don't know whether you've been to the Maldives, a uh, beautiful place, uh, but it sinks easily. When you have tsunami, the whole country is underwater. So they've been alternating between LDCs and, and DCs because at some moment when the water is low, they become developed country, uh, developing country. When the water come up very high, everything is underwater, so it's become a least developed country again. But uh, they, they have done very well on, on tourist promotion. Uh, Cap Verde, uh, Cap Verde has been doing well in terms of tourist promotion. And there's some more countries that are graduating based on, 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 on promotion of, of, of tourism. I just been to Nepal also because they're changing governments every day or every month. You know, you, you never, know, never know whether the Mao is in the government or the non maoists or the you know, royalists. So they all mix. And you know that there's no more Maoists in, in China anymore, but the Mao is existing in India and in, in Nepal. Uh, and it's very hard to work with them because they have their own set of, of concept. They don't believe in anything, in market, in anything. So we have to ask them what to do. And we see that tourism also a hell for Nepal. So last year, uh, when peace actually dawns on Nepal, they, 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 they thought of, 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 of naturally Nepal. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the Nepal uh, tourist, tourism year, they call it National in Nepal, and we help to, to promote the, uh, the concept. I am an amateur painter, so I paint special oil painting for Nepal. The range of the, uh, the Annapurna range, the range of the fishtail uh, uh, mountain, I paint for them and I use this in my Christmas card, and I send it around the world to announce that this is an, a visit Nepal year, National in Nepal, and this is a beautiful range. You don't think this is Switzerland. This is part of Nepal. So I make use of it from time to time. I, when I was in Accra, in, in, in Ghana, and doing some big conference, I, I sketch uh, one of the very, uh, very beautiful uh, uh, old forests. And I, I put it on, again, Christmas card too. Uh, I, I do this. So when I do this, I, I'm, what I'm saying is that I also I, I believe that, uh, that, that there are some, some value added. Uh, uh, that some value added to uh, the, uh, the niche marketing of, of this country in certain way. But uh, this is not the end of the story. The, the, the end of the story for me is that the kind of branding that I would like to see, and I'm equally skeptical on some, some marketing brandings that actually costly, uh, it's just a marketing exercise, but doesn't have much to do with the way they can create uh, wealth and welfare for the people. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of mis, uh, uh, misuse uh, of, of, of some of those uh, adv advertising budgets. Now, the kind of branding that I would like to see when I was thinking of the, the, you know, this discussion, the first thing is that um, you, need, you need to be able to have uh, a country that the state knows its role. I can I come back, this is my, my, my theme song, I mean, uh, the, 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 the enabling role of the state. Sometimes I call it developmental role of the state. The state needs to know what they do for development. They're not just around to just allocate budget or, or to have shift of power and, and to be able to put their people into some state-owned enterprises so that they can gain more power, have appointments of the senior. They have to, they have to think about how to, how to advance educational uh, resources for the countries, how to do more, more health care for the people, if not universal health care, at least for the children. Like what Lula did in, in Brazil in a few years, they, they shift cash to families on the basis that you have to take your children to school, particularly primary education, they have to go to school, they have to be proved, and every year, once a year, the children will have to be taken to hospital to be, to be inoculated for some of the, uh, you know, uh, the medicine. So this is, this is cash transfer in a way uh, to help to, to establish some, some, some long-lasting welfare for the, for the family, and this is something that that, 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 that you can do as a country. So as a country to have a state that is well worse in terms of development uh, policies. Like in Ethiopia at the moment, you would not call a, a, a man like uh, uh, Mr. Menes, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia who has been the Prime Minister for 25 years. My friends called him bad names and I said, I don't agree with you. Because the Menes I know, uh, he, yes, he's been around, he's been, maybe authoritarian, he doesn't allow his opposition to win. He's been winning all the time by only 99% in election. 99%. But what he does for Ethiopian, he preserves the forest there. They don't allow locking and every first forest. You see the schools being built in, 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 as I have never seen before in the last couple of years. You've seen health being improved, health care being improved for the Ethiopian people. You are seeing the modernization of their infrastructure. 
Ethiopia happens to be one of the very few countries in, 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 uh, in, in Africa that has very good uh, aviation connection with the rest of the world. You wouldn't think of Addis, Addis Ababa as a hub, but this is really a hub with Asia, with Europe. You wouldn't think of Kagame, President Kagame, uh, my old friend from, uh, from Rwanda. Uh, he's branded by many countries around the world as a, as a, you know, I mean, tyrant or dictator, I don't know. But for me, he's someone that has actually brought back Rwanda from the abyss. They were killing each other by the millions. At the end of the war, the, uh, you know, the genocide in, in, in Rwanda, I think they killed each other all by two million. And now, you look at Rwanda, Rwanda is one of the few countries in Africa that has broadband connection. It's broadband connection. It's, it's one of the countries that have been mobilizing so much investment from the rest of the world into, into, into Rwanda. Rwanda is one of the most touted eco-friendly tourism. You go and look at the silverback, uh, the, the gorilla. They locate them, they know the number, they have the names, the hundreds of them, they all have names, they know where they're going to go, and every day, every time you, you are brought up, only a group of seven, and you pay a large sum of money to go and watch them, and only seven of you, and oh, per day, three groups, because they have to be fed, they go and they move, and they, it's, it's well controlled. I mean, the thing that he does with it, and he negotiates trade very well. In fact, I invite him, President Kagame to come to Geneva a few times to lecture to the trade negotiator in Geneva how to do trade negotiation. And he keeps telling them you have to, take and to have to give and take, don't take only. If you end up by taking, nobody will negotiate with you. And this is Kagame principle, give and take. So I don't know, I mean, people say people like him, it's not, but I think the way he brands his country as a most modern countries in Africa is something that I like. I mean, this is the thing, the state role is very important. As part of this branding, I think the kind of governance that you have, the branding of governance corruption, uh, there, there are several uh, uh, institutions around the world that put up corruption uh, uh, tables to rank countries according to the corruption, degree of corruptions in countries. Now, I, I, I like these kind of tables very much, as much as I like the competitive table from the World Economic Forum, and the uh, IMD, the International Management, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, IMD in, in, in Lausanne. All these are part of the branding of countries, and they're not branded by, by, the, by the, um, the, the, the national government themselves. Of course, when you brand your own self, you, you, you can search, you can look for the, the best branding and, 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 and presentation and image. But when you are branded by the rest of the world, like doing business by the World Bank, the World Competitiveness Table by IMD and also by the World Economic Forum. Uh, the, uh, the corruption practices, I think, done by so, several institutions around the world. These are brandings that help the countries to be aware of their position in the world. And I like this kind of branding because it's naming and shaming. It's naming and shaming. Uh, and, and it's become something which, when I go to, let's say, the former uh, uh, the, the, the countries in transition, in Eastern Europe. They, 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 they always talk to me about doing business table, and they said, this year we have jumped tail in 10 places. And, and they're very pleased with it. I think this is the right kind of branding to be showing this doing business thing, that we are the countries in this part of the world used to be very difficult to do business. Now we are the best, and we jump across many countries in Asia that seem to be doing better. And, and also with competitiveness table, because in the competitiveness table, you have economic, you have social, you have political, and you have technological uh, factors. And every year they, they fine tune it and fine tune it. And you can see that the top 10 really, or top 20, uh, these are the kind of branding that I think people could be proud of to be part of it. And, and, and the kind of branding that I would like to see. So Mark, uh, to give a long answer to your short question, I, I find that, look, our own branding at the UN is for official basis, official function, particularly in giving aid, assistance. The second kind of branding is the marketing of your products, and we can call ourselves every, every sort of names we think, but some are successful because you know why? They just don't leave it to the name. They, just, they, they practice it also. They try to promote it in a way, and they, they practice it. They support it with the actions in their own country. And the third one is a branding by international um, uh, uh, convention, international convention that could brand you as a, as a democratic, as, as whatever, but, of course, uh, I do think they're exception to the rule. So, for, for some countries that are doing well, they may not pass the taste of the international branding. But 
but sometime you have to make you know and, and to come to break to bricks uh, bricks bricks picks and all this kind of branding with with the names acronym these are all actually artificially branding mainly driven by i would i would call the the, the wall street bankers you see the bricks is, is is just invented by sorry to say goldman sachs but this is this is mainly for the the likes of the goldman sachs who float the bonds and and to push for some investment in some of these countries that they are, they are participating or they are fronting for. So they are coming up with different brands this day. They, they go beyond now BRICS. They, they include, I think, maybe Vietnam now into a different group, also Indonesia and Philippines. So they have different groups now, but they do this to float something to earn money from these countries. You look at the BRICS. I, I don't have anything against the BRICS. But you see any commonality in the BRICS? Between Russia, China, India, Brazil? You think they, are, they have commonalities? They are, they, are, they are growing very rapidly. But I don't think they are resource rich. Not all of them. Maybe Russia and Brazil, they are resource rich. China, maybe so a little bit. But not India, really. And you would say poverty level is it the same as India. It's, it's, it's a huge level of absolute poverty compared to China, which has actually been reducing it. Or in Russia, that is, I don't know, I mean, uh, the, the creation of a new wealth class, whether it has driven people our party or not, I'm not so sure. I don't think they have anything in common. The only thing in common is that it's being conceived as a high, fastly growing economies that are driven by the commercial interests of some investment bankers. And this is very convenient. And people love it. And now, because of this, they all think that they have to group together and now try to bring in South Africa. I don't know why, but South Africa, yes, maybe. Why, then why not Vietnam? Why not Indonesia? And then you can go on. Why not all these countries, uh, Korea and, uh, and Thailand and all this? It's, 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 not, it's not useful. What is going to be useful, I mean, in terms of uh, cooperation? Because if the BRICS the BRIC can lead to more cooperation in the world, it would be good for all of us. But for, for cooperation, it should, it should indicate regional cooperation. If you can have peace in the whole region, you can have similar standards in the whole region. If you can have infrastructure, logistics, being, being committed to in the whole region. If you can have an energy grid in the whole region, that is very helpful for your population. Then, then whether you brand it or not brand it, it's okay. And this is something that I practice. I'm saying this without my experience. When I brand the, the Greater Mekong sub-region, I brand it GMS, Greater Mekong sub-region. I link the Yunnan province of China with the uh, northern part of, 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 of Vietnam, with the northern part of Myanmar, northern part of Thailand, and also some parts of, of Laos and, 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 uh, and, and Cambodia. This was called Greater Mekong Subregion. Why? Because we didn't include the whole country. We include the regions in the country. And we use the river transportation, we use the uh, railway transportation, we use the linkages of road network to call it a Greater Mekong Subregion. And we did it with a purpose to facilitate trade and, transporta and transportation and join, join work in the areas of tourism promotion, all sort of things what we call the, the regional public goods. We promote all sorts of regional public goods as a commonality, and we brand this as a Greater Mekong subregion. And I thought it was useful, and I did the same thing with the southern part of Thailand. I call the IMTGT, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Growth Triangle, and I include five regions from the south of Thailand with the northern regions of Malaysia with uh, one island, I think it's, what is it called? I can't remember the name at the moment from Indonesia. And it has a lot of jo uh, joint activities in terms of communication, uh, 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 marine transportation, investment in, uh, in coal and all these sort of things. So uh, uh, that is another kind of, of, of branding which I would call regionalism that can promote actually the welfare of the people. Well, thank you very much for really a very uh, informative uh, and detailed answer. And what was interesting, many of the countries you referred to, we will actually have a chance to hear from later this week. Uh, Ethiopia, for example, is doing an Ethiopia Day tomorrow morning. Uh, so you may have seen on the schedule, we have the Minister of Tourism, the Ambassador, and they're doing an Ethiopian coffee ceremony uh, as well. Uh, so really bringing the culture. So I think many of those examples we will have a chance to follow up on. Uh, one thing I'll just point out that I thought was quite interesting, Malaysia. I think uh, you probably agree with me. I think the reason why this Malaysia brand has worked uh, as you were saying, is that it's fairly accurate uh, in the sense that you know, they're basing it on reality. And I think that's definitely one lesson learned when it comes to nation branding. You do obviously need to represent realities, otherwise it's, it's bound at some point to fail. Uh, a second uh, thing I'll point out, or a second example, would be Romania. Uh, you were talking a little bit about also Eastern Europe. Uh, what's interesting with Romania, we'll have a chance to meet the ambassador, who's also the former foreign minister, tomorrow he's speaking. 
uh, they did something, I think it was about four or five years ago in Germany, that I was intrigued by, but also a little bit skeptical. They hired one of the most expensive advertising companies in Germany, Schultz and Friends, to basically do an ad campaign for Romania and Germany, uh, and in particular in Berlin. And I was skeptical there, because I said, all right, here's a country which obviously has, has many challenges, many opportunities. Clearly, the image challenge is there. Uh, and I think there, you know, very often Romania is perceived, you know, very often in terms of many negatives. Uh, but I was asking myself, is an ad campaign really the way sustainably to have an impact on, on you know, changing the relationship, let's say, between Germany and uh, Romania? I don't know. Uh, so I think there I was skeptical, you know, these posters basically around the city. Uh, so I'm kind of posing this as a question to you, even though I think we both share kind of a healthy skepticism, uh, is there a causal relationship uh, between high levels of tourism and a strong national brand? Uh, so maybe putting the, the, nation, the nation branding issue aside, if we just look at the issue of the national brand itself, is there a correlation, do you think, between the level of tourism and the strength of the national brand? Well, um, you know, UN has something called UN World Tourism Organization, uh, UN, UN WTO. This is another WTO. It's not the World Trade Organization. It's the UN WTO. We work closely with the, uh, with the UN WTO because we believe that tourism has a lot of uh, backward linkages uh, in, into the, uh, not only into the service industries in the countries, uh, hotel and the, uh, uh, all the amenities and uh, handicrafts and everything. Uh, Tourism uh, can help uh, to enhance what we call the creative econ economy of the country. And, and this is a big thing at the UN at the moment with, the, uh, with us at Angta trying to promote what we call creative economy. And creative economy has to do with tradition, with culture, with the way you express yourself, with music, songs, literature, design, all things that have to do with knowledge, your thought process, and that you can record it, you can, you can uh, patent it, you can earn the rights of your patent and, and fees, and so you can earn money. So these are, these are things that uh, we, we think and we believe that creative economy, tourism, they're, 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 all, they're all linked. But as Mark Wiley said, it, it must be backed up with reality. Uh, you, don't, you don't invite tourists to come to your countries and then, of course, meet with all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of shady practices by the people and... Uh, uh, the kind of uh, misinformation uh, that they, they may have. And, uh, so we, we, we believe, and I have said uh, from the outset that I see a, 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 a correlation between uh, tourism uh, uh, development and, uh, and the graduation process of some of the LDCs. So we are working with, with quite a number of LDCs on tourism. We produce what we call services report, and part of the services report will be services in the area of finance, energy, uh, communication, transportation, logistics, and then also tourism. And, and, and we believe that, that, that tourism is something that uh, uh, can be called sustainable tourism. Uh, sustainable tourism uh, that would uh, not destroy forests, uh, enhance culture instead of destroying uh, of, of culture. Uh, we have actually under the UN uh, uh, something which is not seen uh, in other areas uh, but in tourism, we have a steering committee on, on sustainable uh, tourism. Uh, this is a steering committee that the heads of organizations like myself and UNWTO, UNDP, uh, 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 several other agencies are, are part of this so that we can coordinate in the way we help to promote tourism. And we do see that tourism is also, uh, oh, ILO, ILO, head of ILO is also part of it because it, it promotes a kind of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, of, of employment uh, that could be uh, done in the villages. People can stay at home and women can be employed as well. So uh, they have gender empowering uh, uh, ability and, and can, can bring uh, uh, progress into the, into, into the rural area. So uh, we, 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 we strongly believe in, in, in tourism. Now, I told you this morning that I was in Tunisia and we were talking, I was talking about uh, tourist uh, development in, 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 in Tunisia. And, the president complained to me, uh, he said something which I saw for a long time in Tunisia, that they, Tunisia have uh, very good designs with silverware and all this sort of thing, you know, silverware and some of the leather things. But they, are not, they don't have the niche in the world. People come to Tunisia and they don't know what, what kind of thing. You go to Nepal, Nepal which is a much poorer country than, than Tunisia, the things that you buy in Nepal, although they are produced in China, 
you would have thought they are Nepalese, and they look very much Nepalese. I can't describe to some of the things, but I've been, I'm advising Nepal also and, and, and Chinese government to help Nepal in producing these things in Nepal. The same thing is happening in, in, in Tunisia as well. They are not actually promoting, I don't think you see any, any uh, kind of uh, promotion for, for Tunisian things that are really linked to that tourism. People go to Tunisia and they stay at the beach, I mean, on the beaches and things like that. But if you go into the hinterland of Tunisia, you would see some more culture that is wonderful. I mean, the oasis inside and, uh, and, and, and the practices they have with their, with their customs and, 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 and handicraft and the food they have. But it's, it's not being promoted. We are now trying to work it, uh, it out in a way uh, uh, that, that it can help to link um, employment creation with tourist, uh, tourism development in Tunisia. I, I've been last year to, uh, where was I, Ecuador, and I was on the verge of visiting the, uh, the island. Uh, what is the name of the famous island? Uh, Galapagos. Galapagos, yes, Galapagos. The, the tourism minister is going to come along with me, and that morning the president phoned me, he said, look, there is tsunami uh, in Japan, it's coming across the Pacific to uh, to, to Ecuador and Galapagos, I had to abort the trip, so I didn't go to Galapagos. But I, I'm telling you this story because we are working with the Ecuadorian government to work on tourism promotion for Galapagos. You know, Galapagos is a series of islands. I haven't been, but I was told so much by the tourism. It's a series of islands with these ancient uh, tur tur turtles. But the thing is that uh, the islands are so small, and now they have actually built uh, landing pads, uh, airfields, Airports, so boats going there in hundreds of. So actually, when you when you when I say that tourism can help development, there is a there is a limit to that, there is a saturation point. So the the, the 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 question that is given to me from from Ecuador Ecuadorian government is that look, we like what is happening with uh, with Galapagos, but we don't like it so much now that everybody is is going you know flying from. They can fly from all over Latin America to Galapagos, not only from, uh, from Quito. Uh, they can fly from everywhere. So it's a huge thousand of people, and, and, and the island cannot afford that. So the exercise, even in tourism and promotion of images and branding, you have a limit there. It's an example that Bhutan is really a role model. So we are, apl we are applying for the Galapagos, the, the Bhutanese model, of having the tourists pay upfront. You know, to have to, you have to pay that much. You cannot be just backpackers in, you know, going around smoking this and that in, uh, in Bhutan. You have to pay and, <laughs> and you have to, to, to report. Oh, it's a, it's a bit in control, but this is what I said. I mean, state has to play a role here. Uh, you have to stay, you pay up front, and, and then you don't go and, and spoil the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the landscape, you know, uh, the cost of the, the people to live. The same thing, you see, uh, Bhutan is very well. You go to Bhutan, I would recommend you to go. And you have a bit of a difficulty in applying for your visa, but when you are there, it's really, really some sort of a paradise on earth. And this is, this is one branding for Bhutan. Bhutan is known uh, for its adoption of the so-called happiness index. I don't know whether you've heard of this, happiness index. So when you go to Bhutan, you, before even you reach Bhutan, you feel happy. <laughs> you feel happy because you are going to a country that believes not in GDP per capita, and all these dirty words with, which I've been using all the time, but they, they, they use the word happiness index, and, and you ask them, what is happiness index? It's very vague. It's, it's very vague. It's, it's satisfaction. Yeah, it's satisfaction. It's, it's when you can have holidays, or when you have family around you, uh, when you can express yourself. I mean, it's, it's, I, I say it myself vague because, because I still, you know, we, we, they are holding a big meeting in New York right now, or next week, uh, you know, to... Uh, UN has, uh, has announced it as a special happiness day or something like that, and they invite all of us to go. I cannot go. But this is something that we need to concretize. Uh, President Sarkozy, last year, or the year before last, no, a few years ago, three years ago, he set up a, a committee, jointly chaired by Joe Siklitz and uh, Amartya Sen, both Nobel laureates, to talk about the indicators of, uh, he doesn't call it happiness, but the well-being of the people, instead of using GDP. I don't know whether you've heard of this commission. They have already produced a good report. What they say in essence is that uh, you don't look for, for market tangible, pro, uh, what is it, productions. You look at non-market contribution as well. Because in poor economies, in, in countries, there are a lot of people 
who deliver services, like housewives, or in rural areas in some poor countries, they, people help each other in doing work without being paid. These are not being counted as, as, as part of the, of the income. So how can you say that people are rich or poor because of the income measured by the statistics? And not all these are included in the statistics. So around the world, the branding, the branding now is going, and I'm using Putan way, and I'm citing some of the things from uh, Galapagos. It's really people would like to do more to brand themselves in a way that they are more socially, environmentally oriented. So this is what coming out, going to come out of the Rio Plus 20 thing in the, in the month of June in, in, in Rio de Janeiro. Because we have to come to terms with what to do with this, you know, this, this warming world of ours and, and the way we cannot control environment. This is going to be another branding. But this is another branding that we have to be careful because some of the countries are using or, or abusing some of this branding. Let's say the, the labels uh, that brand your products that countries say, okay, because we, we are very an environment friendly country, we're going to brand our countries that we are, you know, uh, on top of the list in, in terms of control of, of emission. So when, you're, when your products cannot actually uh, uh, identify how much carbon dioxide you're producing, we're not going to allow your products to the country. And so at Rio, we may need to negotiate things that how far we can go in, in, in controlling the way we emit our carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, and in a way, have it, have it brand or have it being certified or standardized by countries, but not to be abused so that some poor countries, they, not all countries, and I've, I don't know whether I said this this morning, but we all have our responsibility. But what we call under the UNFCCC negotiation is that we have common responsibility, but they must be differentiated according to the abilities, capabilities of the country. So we cannot all equally do, and, and of course some of the advanced countries have already polluted the whole world decades before some of the poorest countries can begin to, to, to pollute. So again, branding with this kind of economic exercise and social uh, awareness at the moment, environment awareness, is going to be presenting us with a different kind of branding. Sometimes it will be helpful. Some economists are saying these different brandings of uh, environment-friendly products uh, will create a new Schumpeterian, Schumpeterian you know, cycles of investment, as you know Schumpeter, advocates innovation to, to help create new cycles of business investment. So this is a new Schumpeterized or Schumpeterian uh, kind of investment activities that are going to spawn, be spawn around the world. Excellent. Uh, some very powerful examples. So thank you for, for that. What I'd like to do now is give the microphone immediately to you. Uh, so we actually have a microphone here on the front. Maybe Sanela, if you'd be good enough to, to help. Uh, I'd suggest let's hear, I don't know, five, six different individuals, really your questions, your perspectives. Uh, on the one hand, for Dr. Suchai, myself also, if you have any questions about cultural diplomacy, but also for each other. Uh, let's try to keep this as interactive as we can. I'd suggest, again, let's keep them brief, and that way as many voices as possible can be heard. Uh, so please, this is uh, your panel. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear what are the issues that you're most interested in, what are the questions questions that you very much would like answered today and then also for the coming days and then it's good to sort of get these issues uh, in the open. So I'd ask you please just raise your hand if you'd like to contribute something or pose a question. Uh, my colleague Sanella will help. And we'll take maybe five or six comments, questions and then come back. Yeah? Please. And if you could briefly introduce yourself as well, it would be great. Hello. Uh, my name is Amy Henderson and I'm from Australia. Uh, scholars will agree that uh, fractional fractionalization within cultures causes economic and, and social issues. Uh, so my question is, um, is there a definite role for branding of nations uh, for unification, as was the case for Tanzania? So one language, one Tanzania. And then my second part of the question is, uh, must there be a trade-off between multicultural policies and the unification of branding and the, the probability of, of loss of culture with this branding and unification that can occur? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think in, are you in the front again then? Okay, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yuan from originally from Shanghai, China. So my question is that uh, we know most African countries and Latin America and South American countries were current, uh, former colonies of I think France, Spain, and maybe Portugal as well. Uh, but after that, those countries like I think up to now they are like less developed. But on the country, some countries like United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., they were like former colonies of uh, Great Britain. And after that, uh, I think even nowadays that we can consider them to be like very rich and very successful countries. Do you think that's because they were colonies of Britain, so British people set up like all the institutions and like legal framework, etc., for them? That's why they succeed. 
So that's like kind of my uh, first part of my question. Second part is that in your speech, you mentioned that uh, China invests a lot of money, uh, like also building some economic bridges in Africa and South America. So do you think that uh, China, uh, China is trying to do some kind of modern colonization, or is it just a case of cultural diplomacy? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think if we go back a few rows, if you guys you hold your hands so we can keep track. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Doctor. First of all, thank you for proving that you're half, spending half of your time on the plane traveling all around the world. Uh, I come from Kosovo, and I <coughs> represent one of the regional development agencies funded by European Commission. Uh, in your uh, explanations about the economy and the bridges built, for some reason, you left out Balkans, apart from the fact that you were touching Romania a bit. Uh, how about you share your uh, opinion about uh, the, the bridges, economic bridges in Balkans? Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a hand here. Uh, hi, I'm Kate, and I'm from Belgium, representing IJ, an international student association uh, for cultural bridges. And uh, I actually first have a comment on uh, the person who was talking before me uh, about the Balkans. Um, in Brussels, for example, we have Balkan traffic. It's a festival that we have every year. It's next, no, it's uh, even this month in March, in the end of March. And we also have like uh, music f festivals and everything. So I think Balkans still have like European bridges. But I'll let you decide for that, but I just wanted to comment that Still, the Balkans are very much represented in the countries. But my question was, um, every year in Belgium, we send like, uh, we do trade missions, like we send our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs or our Minister for Trade. And I was thinking, isn't this like turning the economy around? Now we're actually pushing countries to come to Belgium instead of countries asking, can we come to Belgium? And I just think it's the economy the other way around. Do you see this proceeding back to the way it was, that countries will come to us? Or, yeah, that we have to keep on marketing our, our countries, like through the nation branding. Will it keep proceeding like this, or will it become back to the way, like, you need resources and everything, so the country's looking for a certain place? Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to add a comment or a question? Please. Thank you. My name is Madalina. I'm coming from Romania. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, what do you think? Um, I, in, I believe that nation branding can, um, in many cases, can do much uh, worse than good. Uh, in, uh, in the cases when there's a big gap between the expectations and, and the reality. Uh, for example, when you go to um, Paris, you expect to find a very romantic city, and I think Paris is in top one, it's in top ten is the first position of being the uh, most disappointing city because you don't find romanticism there or um, for example Romania you sell it as the um, Dracula country but it's just a legend the castle doesn't exist so uh, that's my question if you think that nation branding can do much worse than good thank you okay anyone else or? yeah okay one more uh, please okay. Um, good morning, my name is Ludo Mokotedi. I come from Botswana, and I work for BEDIA, which is the organization that's responsible for encouraging trade and investment into the country. Um, first of all, I just want to understand that with countries such as ours, us, and in Botswana, we're seen as a shining example in the continent. However, we continue to suffer from being associated with the negative associations that are, are viewed of the continent as a whole. So how would you advise that countries like Botswana, a very small population, we are perceived to be doing all the right things according to the international indices that you talked about earlier. However, we still have um, that challenge of fighting associations that are negative about the continent as a whole. For example, issues of war. Sometimes people will say comments like, Botswana, is that the place where there was civil war in such and such a year? And yet, we've never had war. We hold... Uh, elections every five years. We are the, the, the diamond uh, uh, country. You know, we use all those resources that are generated from that industry to plow back into developing our people, educating uh, the, the, the people who live in Botswana for free. 
you know, things that are really uh, critical, such as healthcare, provision of healthcare and other social um, facilities are all there, yet we continue to suffer in terms of having that negative perception or, Im or image which is associated with the continent as a whole. Thank you very much. So Dr. Subhachai, you have your work cut out for you there. Many, many different questions, uh, but it was really great. I'm glad we also got a chance to flavor out. Is there maybe one final question in the back? All right, we'll do one more if it's okay, and then we'll have about eight to 10 minutes, if possible, for it to try to respond. If you can to all of them, uh, if not, then at least some of them, but please. Thank you. My name is Tima. I'm working here for the ICD, and I'm from Hungary. So my question would be, do you think that tourism is always a tool for every country? What can help to, to develop? Because tourism has also uh, its weaknesses, so the sector, I mean. For example, countries which are not that exotic or there are some instability in the region, then they just can't uh, having that much success in the field of tourism. And if they would focus too much on developed tourism sector, then maybe they would fail concentrate and focus developing on other sectors where they could produce better, I think. And so do you think a uh, danger in that? Thank you. Okay, let's do the best we can. Eight or 10 minutes, but let's <laughs> see. It's a big, a big group of questions. Yeah. These, these are all very challenges, uh, challenging questions. I, I have to admit that I, I won't be able, it's not that, not with, well, even with more time, because I don't know much about some of the things that you asked me. So I hope you would bear with me if I have some ignorance in some of this area. I would like to know more about this. Uh, first question uh, uh, from Australia on, on the uh, bridges for, for unification and to unify countries with similar culture. I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, it, could be, it could be useful, but I see countries that have uh, diversity in, in, in culture that uh, uh, can, be, can be held on together because, because of common, uh, common purposes. I, I don't know. I, in various countries around the world that are doing well, in, in India, for example, I, I said that before, I mean, uh, you go from the north to the south. I mean, it com completely different, different countries, different uh, uh, traditions, different food, different beliefs, different languages, and different governments. So uh, it could be. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't push uh, so much on uh, on the uh, the unification uh, effort. Uh, uh, I think best uh, best is, uh, is is common uh, common interests. Uh, common interests, uh, the sharing of destiny, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's the best way to put it, because uh, in my own country, uh, we have, we have, we don't, we don't put Buddhism as a national religion, for example. Uh, we, we don't put it in our, in our constitution, although there's been a lot of uh, uh, pressure to put Buddhism as a national religion. Why? Because in, in Thailand, we, we allow all kinds of beliefs and, 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 and religions. We have Christian living next door to Buddhism, to Buddhists, to uh, to Muslims. So we don't we don't say anything because we believed in in flexibility, and and that's why Thailand has never been colonized in be, uh, before. And, and and I think we are doing well because we open for everyone. If they all come with peace, uh, with good intention, we welcome everyone. So I I would say that in this present world and the world where when we build bridges and we are close to each other anyway, we should not be looking. Uh, for, for just uh, some of the cultural bridges as a, as a means for unification. Uh, for for, for the, um, uh, the, the issues of, of colony and, and, and successful case, uh, well, again, uh, I don't think all countries uh, that have been uh, former colonies are, are all doing well, although you, you have a point there, that now that I come to think about it, uh, you know, I mean, uh, past colonies actually. Uh, if I if I go by the so-called center periphery, uh, center periphery theory, the center always exploit the periphery. They they take away all their wealth, all their commodities, and they they give back something which is maybe in terms of education, or or bureaucratic administration and things like that. I don't know whether we can we can have a cost benefit analysis of these things, you know, I mean, uh, it, may be, it may be something that is so intangible. Uh, if you would ask my own compatriot, they would have said that, look, I mean, we have been doing perfectly all right without being a colony of, of, every, of, of any country. But uh, again, uh, some of the former colonies are being helped by the uh, uh, host countries before. So uh, 
I, I, I don't have an answer for this. I, I don't have an answer for this. I, I, uh, I always, uh, because I would be very partial. I would be very partial. I, I think uh, colonies uh, brought a lot of uh, uh, sad things to, to countries and uh, exploitation in the past. I don't know whether that could ever be compensated. I, 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 this is my own belief there. Uh, China building bridges in, in Africa in, yes, uh, to tell you the truth, as you know, I mean, China is being blamed for uh, doing a lot of business in Africa without actually uh, 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 putting up the kind of conditionalities for African countries to be, to be adopting modern uh, de democratic uh, government. And China used to retaliate by saying, look, we are not in the business of, of trying to force countries to you know, impose upon countries our own belief. So uh, this, is, this is China approach, and I think at the moment, if I look at what they call the, uh, the aid effectiveness, uh, aid effectiveness uh, agreement, the OECD donors countries agreement, they all want to, to co-op China into this, uh, this regime. They think China is now playing the role of somebody outside of the, uh, outside of the, uh, uh, the donors community and adopting the practice that China can, uh, can only enjoy the benefits. Now, you must have read the book by uh, the uh, lady investment banker by the name of Mojo or something like that, Mojo? Mojo, she, she talks about the death of eight or something like that. She, she's become a celebrity because of this book. And she quoted in her book one of the things that, that actually surprised me a lot. She said, we've done a, a, an African-wide surveys on, on, on investment of countries from former colonies and Chinese investment. Now, you'd be surprised to learn that most uh, of the people who've been surveyed by uh, this institution quoted in Mojo's book, they, they view Chinese investment in, uh, in Africa as something very positive. It's very positive. And, and this is not only one country. It's an it's a African-wide survey. And they welcome China as an alternative donor country. Uh, so I mean, China doesn't come with conditionalities, like we all know. And, and China doesn't get involved with the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the political uh, regime in the country. So uh, this is, this is for, for countries to decide. I mean, uh, I, for one, uh, I've been involved with the, uh, the donors community for so long, because working under the UN, I have to, to discuss these things with the, uh, with the donors and aid effectiveness uh, agreement from Paris. Uh, I still believe that uh, if there is more competition in aid, that countries do not have to be, let's say, monopolizing the aid uh, regime that we see most of the time when you monopolize the aid regime, the aid is always controlled by the, by the, the, the donor's country. What we need is the aid to be owned by the recipient country. This is a will from UN, from Angkat. We want the aid, the assistance to be owned by the country. So it means that you don't always do bilateral aid. You do bilateral aid, you try to, 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 to impose some of the conditionalities on the, on the recipients. We believe more in in channeling aid through multilateral agencies. I'm saying this, you might say, because you have your own benefits, but I have this belief that only when you have the multilateral involvement that would encourage the countries to determine their own uh, destiny, to have ownership. We talk like this for years, for ages. Ownership, 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 and yet we are seeing at the moment the world donate, donation, uh, uh, the, 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 the ODAs being tilted in the bilateral way. Countries are doing more bilateral this day than before. So it's bypassing multilateral agencies like ourselves. We don't like it because, of course, we can do less. But we think when we do the work, we do it not to please anybody. We do it to, to help the, the, the recipient country that should have the ownership. Uh, issues of, uh, of, of Balkan, uh, I know, I know. Uh, we, the, at the UN, uh, most of the issues uh, pertaining to Balkans are discussed along the political lines. Uh, I'm afraid this is the case. And I do believe also that we've done too little, too little on economic assistance to the, to the Balkan countries, really. I have visited some countries, particularly uh, Romania. Uh, I have been to uh, Kosovo, I don't think I have been to. I've been to Serbia, I've been to Croatia, I've been to Slovenia. I've been to some countries in the region. Uh, they are small in a way that uh, it's, it's easier to help them, actually. Uh, they, are, they are very small, but the way that they used to depend on the past regime of, uh, of complete control, that is something that, that, that we need to, uh, to, to, to break away from. Uh, meaning that uh, the, the way market economy will have to be integrated into some of these countries 
is, is something that I, I think we, we have done enough uh, for my side. I, I, have, I have been working with some of the uh, former uh, uh, Soviet Union, uh, you know, the countries in the Eastern Europe, uh, former planned economies in some countries, but not all. And uh, at the moment, I'm trying to get this to be more organized in a way that uh, I have uh, several training uh, courses, uh, for example, in, uh, in what we call entrepreneurship development. I think in the Balkans, as with the former Soviet Union areas and the tran countries in transition, what they need is more training in, in creation of, of entrepreneurs. So I'm working like this with uh, Slovenia, I think, Slovenia, with Belarus, some countries in the region, but not all. I think they should all actually participate. Azerbaijan is working, they're not in, I think they're not part of the Balkan, but Azerbaijan is in Central Asia, but countries like Azerbaijan, very enlightened country, and they're working a lot with us in the training of entrepreneurs, training of trade negotiators, in putting up trade policy. This is what, what, what you would need in the Balkans, and I don't see so much work being done. And you see, Angtat and the UN, all UN agencies, we are driven by, by demand. We cannot go and tell you, look, we want to do this for you. We cannot, although we, we have that in mind, but we can only be driven when you demand us, or when some countries ask us to do something. If EU would have asked us, let's say, let's go and do some work to, uh, to develop entrepreneurship in the Balkans, we would love to do it. And we believe we can do more work because that's what you need, to be able to integrate the market economy into the, into the Balkan e economy. And I think that is, is what being needed. Uh, our friend from Belgium talked about the reverse uh, kind of relationship. This is going to be what I call the new generation of globalization. It's, a, it's, 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 it's where in, it, instead of fund flowing from the advanced economy into the less advanced and developing countries, now funds are flowing more from developing countries into the advanced economy. And, and, and if you look at the accumulation of reserves in this world, the reserves are more accumulated in Asia. It's, it's too much in Asia. Reserves in Asia is about, I don't know, it's 60%. Uh, it's the global reserves would be 7 trillion. China alone is 3 trillion. Japan is about 1.5 trillion or 2 trillion, something like that. The whole of Asia is about 5 to 6 trillion. Nearly, nearly the global reserves are to be found in Asia. It's too much for Asia, and the money are just lying there. They're just bank notes. All these are, these are just investment into some of the treasury bonds and bills and sovereign, sovereign bonds uh, floated by countries around the world. So they're not really being put to use very much. And, and, and I do see that we need to facilitate these flows of funds even more. I, I was citing this morning that when there is a reverse flow of funds, when the emerging countries or the open countries would like to use their money to invest, besides in buying, buying sovereign bonds, they want to invest in companies in, in the advanced economy. They're not always facilitated. And I think this has to change. This is what we call the new mercantilism, new protectionism, because it's not mercantilism in the areas of trade. It's protection in the areas of investment. We have to free not only trade, but also liberalize investment and, and, and to facilitate. I think Europe would need a lot of investment. This year, next year, European banks will be forced, obliged to enhance their capital, the amount, to capitalize more because of the, uh, the, quality, the lower quality of their assets. So they have to capitalize more. They cannot do that because it's huge. It's, it's hundreds of billion euros in a few years' time. So what they have to do is to shrink their asset, to reduce their balance sheet, meaning to sell out their asset. So this is something which if, they, if, Europe, if European banks would like to have better prices for their asset, they better ask their governments to allow more transfer of funds from the rest of the world to Europe so that Europe can gain more from the... If, if, if this is not allowed, then the prices for the asset will be very low. And the world is seeing now that because Europe is going to be forced to sell all these assets very quickly to meet with the requirement of capitalization because of the Basel and everything, Shrinking the balance sheet will mean that the assets will command lower prices. So you better allow competition of, of funds flowing from all parts of the world to compete for these assets. There's going to be a lot of interest in buying this, and this would be better facilitated. This is what I call second generation, where you allow what we call the reverse capital flow. It's capital flowing from poorer countries into the richer countries happening. Uh, Romania, I visited Romania a few times, and the first time I, visit, I visited Romania was in the... Uh, was in the 80s, long ago. And I asked to go and see the castle of Dracula. And the Romanian government didn't allow me. You know, I, 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 this was in the 80s, more than 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And I said, why not? Because if, if people have the wrong idea about Carl Dracula, 
he must be probably one of the very stern uh, ruler of his region, very fair, very just person, but the way he punished people may be a bit drastic, but you see, that is his image. He's, 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 a, he's a very just man. So you can present that instead of just blood-sucking kind of, you know, vampires and things like that. But the second time I went back, they, they brought me to the castle and, you know, and, and now I was told that around his castle, you build up the, all sorts of uh, uh, villages and, and, uh, and, and hotels. Uh, I, I, I think this is, this, is, this is branding again. Romania doesn't, Romania doesn't have only, only, only Dracula. Romania has one of the most pristine uh, forests in the, in the name of Transylvania. In, in the Carpathian, uh, Carpathian uh, ranges of mountains, uh, among the best in the world. You know that the Hollywood people are using these regions for, to film their, their films? Some of the best cowboy films are filmed in, in Romania, and this is something that you can export. Because it's cheaper, I was told by some of the filmmakers, that they go to Romania and film, uh, better, better, better location, uh, you hire people, they do well, uh, you know, the, these... Uh, those who come in into the scene and, 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 and the sceneries are, are more beautiful. So that is something that Romania can, can sell, really. It's, it's something that Hollywood will be needing. And uh, from India, I don't know, some it's, uh, Indian movie makers are now moving out of India. People get, you know, Bollywood, they, they make thousands of films every year. So many, but they, they want now to change. They don't want to make a film of India. In India, they want to go outside. So again, this is something that uh, countries like Romania can really offer to the rest of the world. It's, it's a service industry, and it can help to, to, to bring the best image of, of, of Romania uh, to the world as well. Botswana, I have been once to Windhoek, and uh, it's, it's one of the best, uh, uh, I would say, govern. You talk about Botswana, right? Yes, it's, 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 it's one of the, I think, best regulated country in, 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 in Africa. Actually, uh, I think you, you uh, you, you, are, you are modest because Botswana for us at the UN is one of the role, is a model country, Botswana. In governance, in your participation, in democracy, in the cleanliness. The, the only problem I think Botswana has is an old problem of HIV AIDS, which is, which is a problem for nearly the whole Africa. But I don't know why in, in Botswana uh, to deal with HIV AIDS, is, it takes a long time. So that is, that is the key thing to deal with Botswana. But you have a government which is really... Uh, uh, very transparent, very democratic, and, and a lot knowledgeable. I, I, I visited, and I, they, they visited me many times in, in Geneva, and we worked a lot with them in, uh, in areas of tourism. You have some of the uh, safaris, and, and you kept it very, very natural and, and not commercialize it at all, and uh, it, it's very well run. It's, it's, it's co-tourism in its best, uh, best manner. So you've got a lot of good things going for Botswana, except for, I think, the HIV AIDS, which is the whole of Southern Africa is very much uh, affected by, by this HIV AIDS. And um, uh, uh, for countries like Hungary, uh, countries in transition, they are part and parcel of the work that I have to do. But in the past, we are not asked to do much to help. Although transition countries, you see, sometimes they fall under the UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe. UNECE is supposed to be looking after Europe and so also countries in transition like Hungary. But for me, in terms of economic development, they fall between the cracks. They're not developed countries, they're not developing countries. They're countries in transition. They're not rich, they're not poor. So they don't get, they get the best, the worst of both worlds. They get the worst of, worth, of, of both worlds. So I'm trying now to work with uh, uh, some countries. Uh, again, uh, I have to work on the basis of demand driven. I cannot go into Hungary or into Poland or any countries to say, look, I'm coming here to help. But like from Belarus, Belarus is one of the countries that have actually learned how to work with us very well. We are being used in, in particularly in, in investment area, I would advise, because some of these countries depend so much, they are linked with the former Soviet Union, with Russia. Uh, they are now being linked more to Germany. But what they should be doing is to look more towards the rest of the world. Belarus has this uh, uh, world view of being linked more to the East, to Asia. So we are being tasked to see how we can link countries like Belarus or countries in transition with the Asian economy because Asian is now commanding you know, the bulk of the growth of the world. So it's better to be linked more with them. And this, this is something on trade policy, investment policy, that we're working with countries like Belarus. We would like to do more uh, for the countries in transition, but we, we need to be, to be asked to do. We can't just go in and, and work uh, with... with 
in my own reports, in our own studies, we try to include a lot of analysis of these countries on our own. But we're not, we're not being, being uh, I, I, Balkan is an area I would try to take up to see what we can do more. The Baltic states also, uh, on and off, we've been trying to work together, but not very much in, in essential, uh, essential terms. But on, con on the con con contrary, the Central Asian region, the Eurasian Asians in the areas around uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 Aral Sea and uh, uh, you know, all these countries around Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, all these countries, they are working better with us, including Kazakhstan, particularly in the areas of transportation. Transportation and water management, because that's an area in which transportation is badly needed. They cannot actually transfer goods among themselves. They keep fighting on the borders. And the water management is hopeless, because some countries water, some countries no water at all, and they fight for waters. And so we are working with these countries. Uh, I don't think we should wait for the, uh, for the problems to arise. We need to be thinking in terms of how to link Balkan, Baltic Sea to the rest of the world, to be more diversified. You know, you should not be dependent on few economies or only on Europe and everything. It's good to have European Union to help you. But the world is changing so much that the prosperity of the world is, is really being driven by, by many different regions around the world. So you should try to be more connected with those things and uh, we would be uh, always ready to, to help if you would uh, put in the, the request. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think really the keynote address this morning was excellent. So I thought this panel discussion was wonderful. You really came representing the United Nations. And I think really your own history, we were able to touch on so many different regions of the world. I thought that really provided a great framework uh, to begin the conference. So I would ask everyone to please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Dr. Sipachai. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, but we also discussed a little bit.